evening. How are we doing? Are you ready to get to singing? Let me try to encourage us in our singing. The Bible says uh, in Psalm 40, it said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Now get a hold of this. And set my feet upon a rock. Amen. And establish my goings. So what's the result of that? And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God, many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. So let's allow that song to come out tonight, shall we? Let's turn to number 147. What a privilege we have to have fellowship one with another. We're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. We're in the uh, soul stirring this time because I think we got a few more than this morning. Soul stirring. I think we have enough of the other book to pass around. 147. Can I ask you to stand with me and let's sing? And again, remember, get that book up and sing out to the Lord and let's lift our voices to the honor and glory of God. Here we go. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning on Jesus Christ, my Savior, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning on Jesus Christ, my Savior, leaning on the everlasting arm. Now as we sing that second, we'll get to the chorus. You ladies pick up on that little repeat thing. Uh, when we say leaning, you're saying leaning on Jesus Christ, my Savior, okay? You pick up on that, harmonize with us, and man, it'll sound, sound angelic, amen? Here we go. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Good job. Leaning on Jesus Christ, my Savior, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace. Do you have it tonight? Amen. Leaning on the everlasting arm, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. While you're standing, number 56, when we all get to heaven, oh, you know, when you say that title, you just got to say the other title. Won't it be wonderful there? Amen. When we all get to heaven, all of this will be over with. It'll all be glory, and we're looking forward to that. Amen. So let's sing about it here. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Oh, while we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling, listen to that, not a shadow, not a sign. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, when we We'll sing and shout the victory. Oh, let us then 
be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So, oh, wait a minute. Yes, sir. Oh, so onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open and we shall tread the street of gold when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. prayer meeting like we've been having every night. Altar's open if you want to come pray here at the altar. We're praying that God would meet with us if we go through all this and God doesn't show up. It's all just a show. Uh, I read someplace today where a certain group performed at a certain church. We don't perform at our church. We try to bring glory to God. And if he shows up, we'll have that glory to God. We want to hear from God, meet with God, and have open hearts to receive and obey what we hear. Ask that God bless these preachers and fill them with power. Give them his special touch tonight. This is the last night, folks. I, I'm excited. Amen. I can't hardly wait. Yes, so let's pray. In a moment or two, after I hear it kind of quiet down a little bit, then I'll pray and close, and we'll get on with the singing and with fellowship and preaching and just glorify and praising God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we have been reminded this week about how great and above our thinking you are. We've been reminded that you're the God who inhabits eternity past, you inhabit the present, you inhabit eternity future. And Lord, we're in the present right now. What we've heard already this week has been wonderful. It's blessed us, and we thank you for it. And Father, we pray that tonight, in the present, you would show up again and just pour out abundant blessings in our hearts. Not, Lord, so that we'll just feel good, but, Lord, so we may even be convicted that your Holy Spirit would show us where we need to change, confess our sins to you, get things right. God, our nation has absolutely no hope without you. And there's no hope for bringing America back to you except Christians. So may we see how desperate a need it is. Bless these preachers as they preach, these singers as they sing, the fellowship through singing of the hymns, whatever it is tonight. May Christ be glorified. May you have your way. 
And may we be thrilled about being in your presence tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> Glory land is not so far away, and we'll reach it some glad day. Heaven's home is now my final goal, there to live while ages roll. What a happy day will be. Of the glory of Jehovah, Paul preached that all is lost save knowing Christ. Beloved John said he is precious by leaning on his bosom. So for a moment may I humbly testify. Did I mention that I love him? How I worship and adore him when I can see no way he makes a way. about my Jesus how many songs have been sung about God's Son there are not enough words enough notes in the music to tell the story of all my Savior has done did I mention that I love him how I worship he ever made me I love him that's all I want to say and oh how I love Jesus oh how I love Jesus and did I mention that I love him how I worship 
worship and adore Him when I can see no way. He makes a way. He makes a way. Did I mention He's been faithful to every promise He ever made me? I love Him. That's all I want to say. serve God as any other day, bound and determined to live in God's favor, and nothing would stand in his way. Then the messengers came one by one with their stories. In just a few moments, Job lost all he had. Great wealth and riches, the health of his body, even his children were dead. The Lord giveth, he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His wife came before him to voice her opinion. She said, you should end it. Just curse God and die. Job arose from his ashes. He looked toward heaven and brushed back the tears from his eyes. And he said, the Lord giveth, he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When troubles come suddenly, blessed be the name. When the storm winds blow violently, blessed be the name. When Satan comes oppressing me, Blessed be the name, I will still serve God faithfully. Blessed be the name, the Lord giveth, he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, I've served him before and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Served him before and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Boy, I don't seem to know how to operate this thing. It has, it has one button, and that's pretty complicated for me. It comes up red, and then it stops coming up red. Is it supposed to turn red or anything? While he's doing that, I want to say thank you again to the ladies and whoever might have had a part in the meals, uh, the cooking. I've only had one of them, and oh, my word, it was delicious. It was so good. And I want to thank you for the service that you have done this oh, week to uh, take care of your guests outside. 
Uh, we have a meeting like this at our church. Thanks. Thank you, preacher. We're ready to set roll now. Amen. You've got enough power to last 25 minutes. Amen. That's about what I got. By then, I'll burn out. <laughs> but, um, okay. Can, can you hear me all right? All right. Uh, but we, we do have a meeting like this, Brother Gilbert, and we do understand the labor that goes in uh, with something of this magnitude. And uh, so I don't want to take it for granted. I just want to thank you all for the hard labor that you've done and uh, then the preacher for allowing us to be a part of it. It's just a, a joy to be able to stop in. I wish we could have been here for the whole thing, but um, we, we weren't this year. But maybe, maybe next year we can come and be a little bit more because I, I like what's going on. I enjoy being around God's people, don't you? Yes. There's, there's no people like this people. Right. Amen. Yeah. And it's a great crowd to be around. I, in Mark 14 is where we'll look. And I, I also wish that I could tell you some jokes. I'm not a good joke teller. Uh, my wife wrote me some so that I could read them. But uh, <clears throat> I don't even do a real good job reading them. So um, can I just suffice to say, uh, let's just get in the text and read and get into the preaching tonight, shall we? Mark chapter number 14, the Bible says in verse number 32 is where we'll pick up the narrative. It says, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The Spirit truly is ready. But the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And he returned. He found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now. Take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. I'd like to talk to you a few moments tonight. <clears throat> the actual subject to be considered is the prelude to Calvary. As we think upon <clears throat> our subject to be thought about upon this evening, I believe it is important that we are careful to understand the purpose behind our author's course of writing. Mark is setting forth, are you listening, our Lord as a servant. By attaining a good understanding of this, we can make a connection with our Lord's humanity. Thus we too can be and become the servant that God wants us to be. Uh, Mark basically identifies six qualities of this servant. Number one, chapter one and verse one, he is the sent servant. I say these by way of introduction to remind us that he is the master servant and he is the one who is trying to teach us how to be a servant as well. And may I say, may we be a sent servant. Many are holding back on God. And I say to the boys when they come and sing, let her rip, let her go. May we be as servants of God sent and may we let it go. Serve God faithfully. He was a sent servant. In chapter 1 and verse 7, he is the superior servant. Uh, see, he has a superior 
uh, uh, position above uh, this world. And I want to remind us that we are not of this world, amen, and we as servants ought not be acting like this world. We ought to be acting different from this world. And he is the serving servant, according to Mark chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. And that's exactly why we are here. In fact, isn't that what servant means? Serving. Serving the Lord. Chapter 14, in verses 32 through 42, we see that he is the submitted servant. He has given himself and uh, has allowed himself to be uh, used by God and has, uh, uh, has uh, humbled himself to be what God, he submitted himself to God's will. Chapter 15, in verse 20 through 45, we see that he is the suffering servant. And sometimes we too will suffer as a servant of God. Oh, but we're in good company when we do so. In chapter or number 6 in chapter 15, all the way to the end of the book, we see that he is the successful servant. And may I remind us as we try to pattern ourselves after this servant that we too can be successful for God. He has given us all that we need, everything that we need. He is all and in all. And everything that we need, his word, he has given us to be successful while we serve the Lord here. From these Identity marks, there are three areas that greatly benefit us as believers. Hang on, we're going somewhere, so please stay with me. And let me ask you, as I asked our people at home, would you listen with your heart and not just with your ears and your head today? See, the head cannot wrap around and cannot really get a hold of what the truths of God's word are. But the heart, God can guide and help to get a hold of those truths. And so would you listen tonight with your heart? Those uh, things that will benefit us. Number one, I want you to pay attention to the master's attitude, the Lord's attitude. Uh, what is his attitude? Well, he is just a servant. He does not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. In fact, the Bible even alludes to the fact that he humbled himself. Is it because that he uh, has no reason to be exalted above? Oh, no. He deserves all honor and glory, but he made of himself no reputation. And may we take on the attitude that we are nothing more than a servant. I remember a preacher by the name of Brother Dan Martin was preaching at Brother Spencer's meeting up north here a little ways and we've never forgotten it. Our family have tried to grab a hold of this particular truth that he gave us. He said you will never uh, know if you are a servant until you know how you act when you're treated like a servant. And may we have an attitude that says that's exactly what we are, a servant of God. But then we not only see the master's attitude, may I say we also see the master's actions. He acted like a servant. And that's important that we do that. And then the last thing, may I say, the Lord's attention. You know what we like? We like attention to come to ourselves. Come on. Shake your head. I'm not going to try to get you to say amen, but at least shake your head. We like that, don't we? We like the attention to be upon us. But may I remind you everywhere the Lord went, he put the attention upon those that he cared about. He was a servant, and he loved those that he served, and that's exactly where we're supposed to be. So now as we enter the closing day of our Lord's serving days here on this earth, we get to see our Lord reveal how to deal with and cope through not just the pleasurable times of the servant's life, but now in the pages to come, we are going to get to see him as a servant during the painful and trying times of the servant's life. This insight comes to us in five parts. We won't preach them all tonight. There are five different messages. But uh, number one, it starts with the prelude to Calvary. It then goes up that path of the Via del Rosa as he goes up uh, to Calvary, the path to Calvary. But then uh, we come to the place of Calvary where he gave his life. And then we see the prevailing of Calvary. Uh, may I say, he did not stay on the cross. He came down. 
down and he came up. Amen. He arose victorious uh, over death, hell, and the grave. And so we have the prevailing of Calvary. But not only that, ladies and gentlemen, then in the last chapters we find that you and I are granted the partnership with Calvary. You and I have the privilege to serve the living God. What a privilege, isn't it? Uh, to serve the Lord. Beloved, would you take a moment and journey with uh, uh, our servant into this prelude of Calvary. You know, I forgot to look up something. Somebody real quickly, if you would, would you get a song book and find for me that song, um, uh, I think it's Lest I Forget Gethsemane or it's um, Lead Me to Calvary. I don't remember the title but anyway, would somebody get that for me here in just a moment? But I want you to see the prelude. Would you go with me now to the book of John? John in chapter number 18. We have a, another part of this story told by John, the one that we have just read. In chapter 18, in verse 1, the Bible says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples, thank you, over the book Kedron, uh, and uh, where was the garden? Into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torture, uh, torches and weapons. I want you to notice three things very quickly as we try to move into this prelude of Calvary, uh, this garden scene that we have. I want you to notice, first of all, the location of this place. It was a garden that he is in. It is a place that he oft times resorted thither. And so we see the place. But not only the location of place, may we also look at the lowliness of this place. No, it is not the palace that he is in. No, it is not the throne that he deserves to have. It's a lowly garden that the Son of God goes in. It is not a place where he is standing and the anthems are singing, are being resounded around him as people are singing his glory and his honor. No, it's a place where the Master is bending the knee before the Father. It is a lowly place. Philippians 2, 7, he made of himself no reputation, but took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross I'm talking about this place this place called a garden uh, not only that I want you to see the love for this place he often resorted there. He came there on an often, on a regular schedule. He brought his disciples here. It was a place that Jesus loved. It was a solitary place. You and I need to find a solitary place with God. A place where we can get alone with him. A place where the busyness of life will be set aside and where all our attention will just be on our master. But not only a solitary place, I want to say it's a silent place. I want to tell you, if you have a family of seven, sometimes that is a difficult place to find. Especially when you're traveling and you're staying in a little tighter quarters of time. You can't just go in a certain spot and close the door. Uh, you're there, and if you do close the door, the knocks come. But may I say, ladies and gentlemen, we must, we must find a place that is silent where we can get alone, where we can hear the voice of the Master and spend time with Him. Jesus resorted to this uh, uh, garden. He resorted there often. It was a solitary place, a place where He could be alone. But then it was a place where He too could have silence and be with His Father. <clears throat> now, friends, Step in with me. Step in with our master servant. It doesn't take long to sense that you and I are standing on holy ground. I recall as a young man just about to graduate from high school, <clears throat> I re recall one of these times in my life where I felt like I stepped on holy ground. Brother Ken Graham uh, at the boys' home took us and we traveled together and sang, believe it or not, 
of people would actually listen to us. And we sang. And uh, on this particular trip, it was our senior trip. We had went around to several different places. And we ended in um, a little town called Myrtle, Mississippi. It was a place where a man by the name of Percy Ray, and I'm not here to uh, say whether you like or dislike. That's not the point this uh, 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 afternoon, if I may say. The point that I want to get across is I remember Brother Ken saying when we pulled into that place, Brother Gilbert, he said, guys, listen, when we get here, you know, we were laughing. We're boys, and boys are going to be boys, and we were just cutting up and having a great time. But when we pulled into this place, I remember Brother Ken saying, boys, it's time now to be quiet and very serious. Uh, this is not a place to do a lot of cutting up. Let's go around, explore, and look at this uh, uh, campground. Camp Zion is the name of the place. And, and so I remember that we pulled in to that place. And when we pulled in, uh, we opened the doors and we stepped out. And I kid you not, uh, and, and, and this is a miracle in itself, that uh, five teenage boys would completely become silent. That's a miracle in itself. But I remember stepping out of the car, and I, and I do not forget that it seemed like we, we, we could sense the presence of God there. I remember uh, that we got to walk around the car, and as we walked around the car, Brother Ken said to us, he said, maybe, uh, just maybe we might get to see uh, Mr. Percy Ray, our brother Percy Ray. And about that time, a door opened, and out stepped Percy Ray. And man, I'm telling you, Brother uh, Creed, there was a glow about the man. I, I kid you not, that's just the way I felt, at least anyway there was a glow I felt like I was standing on holy ground but may I remind you Percy Ray is not the Lord Jesus Christ and in this day in this particular garden as we walk in I can't help but to sense the holiness of him that the Bible says for thus saith the holy one that inhabiteth the eternity whose name is holy oh it is him that is bowed in this garden it is this ground that you and I shall walk upon for a few moments it is midnight, and on Olive's brow, the star is dim that lately shone. Tis midnight in the garden now, the suffering Savior prays alone. One might hastily ask, why so much about this little garden? May I answer that with God's help for a few moments uh, through five thoughts about this garden this evening. But before I do, I'd like for you to listen to the words of William J. Kirkpatrick as he wrote uh, here. Uh, yes, it says, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. Will you listen to the chorus, please? Lest I forget what? Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. I'd like to consider several things about this particular garden that I think are pertinent. I think they're important for us. Number one, I'd like for you to see the symbolism of the garden. See, just as this garden is the commencement of God's redemptive work, it is only so because of another garden where we find the cause for this redemptive work. In that garden, Eden, if you will recall, sin gained its power. Thus it dominates mankind. Sin earns its price tag, being determined by God. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Sin's perdition, the damnation of all. It says, whosoever shall not believe, uh, shall uh, the wrath of God abideth on him. And I'm here to say, it was in that garden that sin began its ugly rule and reign in the lives of mankind. Sin's pundit. Who is that? Well, it's the sneer of the devil. The devil has uh, creeped into this particular garden. We find in Romans chapter 5. Would you turn there with me? Several portions of scripture that we must read in order to be able to lay the foundation of what we're doing this, this evening. In Romans chapter 5. Look with me if you would please. In verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man, what? Sin entered into the world and death by sin sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. See the first Adam in his garden exerted his will to the ruin of the human race but dearly beloved the second Adam in his garden deserted his will for the redemption of the human race. The first Adam willingly partook of the fruit of a tree 
out of the will of God and penalized mankind with death, but the second Adam, hallelujah to God, willingly partook of the fruit of a tree in the will of God and pardoned mankind by his death, amen. I'm saying that this garden symbolizes another garden where a serpent slithered in and hung in a tree. He, by insurrection, stole away the attention of man from the affair uh, and from that affair was locked up in prison and man became a prisoner of sin. But oh, my friend, in this garden, the Savior steps through and hangs on a tree so that when man's attention is brought back to him, him, uh, uh, back to God. Him, uh, he is freed from prison. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth. And the truth, what? Shall make you, what? Free, free, free. It's because he stepped through this garden and hung upon a tree. One more time, may I say, in that garden, the serpent works over man. And he crumbles, man does. And wilts to the onslaught. But in this garden... The serpent works over the son of man. And listen now as he cries, Oh, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, Satan does not prevail. And I, I, in Luke chapter number 24, verse 46, he said, and, and said unto them, thus it was written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Hallelujah, the devil did not prevail in this garden. The symbolism of the garden. And then I want us to notice the serenity in the garden. What do you mean serenity? Serenity speaks of peace and tranquility, joyfulness. See, in the first garden, Adam had a place where all was peace. He walked with the voice of God in the cool of the day. All day long, uh, uh, and lay uh, everything that God had all lay at Adam's disposal. No worry, no fear. Oh, but how it changed because of a choice that was made in the garden. See, a wrong choice took away all peace and placed it with fear and worry. What brings one to fret and to worry? I'll tell you what it does. The curse. The curse. Uh, what is the curse? The ground shall be cursed for thy sake. And by sweat of thy brow, by work, you will be able to provide for yourself. And what is it that causes worry and fear and fret in the hearts of people today as they scurry about trying to get their needs met, uh, trying to work, trying to do, trying to attain? Everything they do is so that they might be able to get rid of fear and worry. Fear of starvation, maybe. Fear of uh, not uh, someone coming in and stealing what they have. But I'm just saying it's sweat. It's work for provision, for protection, for prosperity. Someone said we get all we can. We can all we get. And we sit on the can. Why? Because in fear we're afraid somebody might take it away. Absence of peace. Oh, my dearly beloved enter once again into this second garden. Preacher, you might say, it doesn't sound very peaceful. It doesn't sound tranquil. I hear one as though he is in turmoil. He almost seems to be at war. Uh, he is, friend. But here now, just as uh, we listen to his agonizing in prayer, pay attention to how he agonizes in prayer. See, as he works and, and as he uh, sweats here in this place, remember the curse? Uh, by the sweat of your brow, by work. And so here we have the Son of God in another garden and he's sweating and he's working. But there's a missing ingredient in the first garden that is found in the next garden. What is he sweating? What is it, Hulk? Oh, 
What is it that brings peace and joy and happiness to a man's soul? Nothing but the blood. And he sweats as it were. Great drops of blood. I'm saying hallelujah to God. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I'm here to say in this garden, the Son of God, he works and he sweats, but he takes care of that curse. He removes, helps us with the curse. Oh, yes, friend, he is fulfilling the curse. He's fulfilling the curse. The blood brings peace back into the lives of those who will put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the first Adam, are you listening? Because of a choice, had nothing but gloom set before him, and that was death. Oh, but the second Adam, because of choice, had nothing but glory set before him. Would you look with me to Hebrews chapter number 12? Uh, You said, wait a minute, glory? Yes, glory. Well, then why did he have gloom? Because of death. But notice this second Adam in Hebrews chapter number 12 in verse number three. For consider him uh, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest you, oh, wait a minute, verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the what? For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'm saying in that first garden, Adam gave way to Satan's uh, enticement, and he, he made a bad choice, and death passed upon men, and fear came into the heart. But because of a choice that the second garden, the second Adam took, I'm saying hallelujah to God. There's peace and contentment in the Father's house today. Hallelujah. Why? Because of the joy that was set before him. So we see the serenity of the garden. But then number three, I'd like to look at the success of the garden. Are you all right? See, there's a contrast of views here. Uh, success of the garden, yes. A contrast, yes. Go with me to the book of Genesis, would you? Genesis chapter number four. It's all right to turn in the Bible and use it a little bit, isn't it? Genesis chapter number four. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter number four, we have recorded for us in verse 25 that Adam knew his wife and she bare a son. But in chapter number three, let me give this to you also so you can kind of grab a hold of it. In verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the what? Of the what? Of the tree of life. Contrasting views. I can see Adam as him, his wife, And Cain and Abel now have to leave. And as they have left the garden, the garden's still there. And here Adam and Eve are and their sons and they're growing. And he begins to tell them about the choice that he made. He said, guys, let me take you and show you something. He comes over to the edge where there's a cherub with a sword drawn. He says, we used to live in there. Oh, the peace, the wonder of such a beautiful place, that garden. Are you hearing me? Yes. And he says, sons, I'm telling you, dad made a bad choice. And ever since that day, it's not been the same. Man, I used to walk with God in the cool of the day. Walk with God, Dad? Yeah, I used to walk with God. Hang on to that. I used to walk with God in the cool of the day. What's that all about, Dad? Well, don't worry about it. It's not as meaningful anymore. 
Oh, if you look there, boys, see that tree that's all twisted and ugly? Yeah, I see it, Dad. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I chose one day to take a piece of that fruit that God told me not to take. And I disobeyed God. And because of that, we could no longer go into the garden. Can you think about this for a moment? Cain and Abel all of a sudden start serving them and somewhat trying to bring sacrifice to God. So Adam must have started teaching them something about God. Come on. And so there they are. And they're learning about the Lord. And so Abel makes a choice. And Cain makes a choice. Cain chooses to grab that which is his own works. And Abel chooses to obey God and bring a sacrifice uh, uh, of the first thing of the flock. And you know the story, and I'm trying to hurry. But God rejects Cain's offering and accepts Abel's. And Cain arises and kills his brother. I submit to you that whether it was a knife or a rock or whatever it was that he used to smite Abel with, it went further than Abel's head or his heart. It hit the very heart of his daddy. His daddy sitting here thinking, man, all of this, why? Because of a choice that I made. Can you see the gloom that is hanging over his head? Can you see the despair that is there? It's the same that you and I were in before Jesus Christ. The same despair. The gloom that is there. One day, after all of this has taken place, Adam knows his wife, and his wife bears another son by the name of Seth. If you'll do a study, you'll find out that Seth means the appointed child. That's another message all in itself. The appointed child. And so Seth begins to grow up. Cain has left dad. So now God's given him another son, and here Seth is. And I can see the same type scenario. Seth, come, let me take you on a little stroll. Hang on, I'll be done in a few minutes. Please stay with me. And they go on this stroll and Adam takes Seth over and he says, see that, see that angel there? He's guarding the place where your mom and I used to be able to live. We got to enjoy walking and communing with God. Yeah, we used to do that, son. And Seth said, you used to, huh? Yeah, we used to. We don't do it much anymore. You see Seth, as he's growing up and thinking about that garden. One day, the Bible says Seth has a son. A contrast of use. See, Adam said, look in, that, look in that garden. You see that twisted tree? It reminds me of the choice that I made. Seth comes over one day. He's got a little boy bouncing along with him like you have your grandson. He walks over and he's just kind of curious. And he begins to look in that garden. He looks past the flaming sword and there yonder he sees that twisted tree and he thinks about the gloom that Adam's been talking about all along. But there's another tree that he gets a hold of. There's another tree that he gets a hold of in view. He says, wait a minute. That tree's different than that twisted tree. That tree right there is just budding with life. That tree right there just seems to be enjoying itself. He begins to think, oh my, there must be something more than that gloom. And I'm here to tell you, the Son of God, Seth, begins to look through that garden and I believe in my heart in, 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 my, in, in my mind I believe that Seth could, could see beyond uh, that gloom and that doom of his dad and he could see the son of God hanging upon a tree that tree of life, hallelujah that tree of life that brought life to your soul and to mine there's a different view of, of a perspective of a view here Seth says wait a minute, it's not not all gloom. There's some glory here. Amen. Where? It's in that other tree. You say, how do you get that? Well, listen to your Bible. Listen to your Bible. Are you here? 
Read this verse with me, verse number 26. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then men began, then, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. You remember Adam saying, oh, I used to walk in the cool of the day with God in that garden. I haven't done that in a long time. Oh, Seth looks in and he sees a tree there that's different than any other tree. I believe he sees the Son of God hanging upon a tree, done for the sins of the whole world. And he looks at his boy and he says, boy, we're gonna grow up and we're gonna be different than everybody else. We're not going to look at the gloom. We're going to look at the glory of the cross. And he begins to teach his son how to call upon the name of the Lord. And in this next garden, what is Jesus doing? He's bowing and walking with the voice of his father. Mm. I hope you're with me tonight. Hope you're all right. See? I've lost my place. I'm here. So, there it is. See, Seth, he didn't see gloom. And a tree, a sin tree, and only heard, oh no, Seth saw grace. He saw grace in a saving tree. See, he began to see help. He began to see hope. Where does our help come from? Oh, Psalmist David made that clear, didn't he? He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. No, 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 no. Psalm 121, help me get it back over there. Psalm 120, Psalm 121, help me. I will lift up my eyes, there it is, unto the hills. Oh, where? From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. I'm saying Seth taught his son to begin to pray. And it's through this garden that you and I find the real key, the power in our life. It is not uh, soaking around with this world. It is not trying to do things in the power and energy of our flesh. It is spending time. It is staying in the garden with him. In prayer, and that's exactly what our Savior did. Oh my, I gotta hurry. Lastly, well, not lastly, next to last. Not only do we see the success of the garden, I want you to see the stress of the garden. Mm. Stress, yeah. The Bible says that the Son of God prayed. And it goes on to say that he prayed more earnestly. And then it says in Luke's account that he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Remember that? That's when a person gets to an emotional state to where there's really no turning back. But this is not just any person. This is the Son of God. And we see the stress in the garden. Think with me a minute. When God created Adam, how did he create him? Did he create him perfect? No. He created him innocent. You can't be perfect without a test. And the first Adam was placed to a test where the slithering serpent, you remember, hung in a tree and he chose to get out of the will of God. He chose to disobey God. He chose to go from innocence into guilt when he could have gone from innocent into perfection, but he failed the test. But not so in this garden. In this garden, the Son of God is wrestling with Satan. He's wrestling with him. He's sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And they overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb. Once again, here we are with the blood. And the Son of God wrestles with Satan. There is great stress in this garden. But shall we read the Word of God? Shall we find out what the Bible says about this temptation of Christ? Shall we find out how far Satan got along? Will you go with me over to the book of Hebrews? Whoo, man, I'm having a good time. I don't know about you. This book is wonderful, friends. It's a wonderful book. In Hebrews chapter number two, in verse number 18, I've lost my glasses somewhere. For in that he himself suffered being what? 
being tempted, he is able to, oh, thank you, to succor, I hope I'm reading the right verses, to succor them that are tempted. And in chapter number four, if you will, of Hebrews, look at verse number, whoops, went too far. Hebrews chapter four, look at verse number 15. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet, without sin, hallelujah. The first Adam failed, but the second Adam succeeded. He is the perfect, sinless Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. Now hang on. Get a hold of this. I hope you're with me. I hope I'm not losing you. The sin that took place in the garden, God had a lot that he intended You want to write this down? He had a lot that he intended for Adam. And there was a lot more that was going to be included for Adam. But because of sin, all that God intended for Adam was stopped. And all that God included for Adam was stolen away by Satan. But there was a Savior who hung on a tree. And may I say while he hung on that tree, are you, are you with me? He, his left hand reached way back there to everything that God intended for mankind to enjoy and to have with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Ghost. He reached way back there and he grabbed of all of those intentions that God had and he pulled them to himself and allowed them there on that cross to begin to flow through his body. And then he reached way out yonder in eternity future and he grabbed all of those things that are included by God Almighty for those that love him and are looking for his appearing. And he grabbed those things and brought them together in the cross and the Bible says he had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Why? He became sin for us. Why? So that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, everything that God intended for us to have is available through him. Everything that God has included for us to have is available to us. And it all flows through the sun wow. to you and to me. The second Adam made it possible. Mm. So the stress of the garden. Lastly, if I could real quick, I'd like to tell you about the secret found in the garden. Secret, yes. You remember I said that each of these five things that have to do with Calvary all have some application in them to help us to see how we might be a better servant of the Lord. So, we have some secrets found in the garden. What secret? Number one, I'm almost done. Are you you listening? Number one, surrender. That has to do with our attitude. You remember I talked about the Lord's attitude? Surrender. Surrender. Surrender to God. See, get a hold of this. The essence of sin, what is it really? The essence of sin is the assertion of our will against God's will. And what did our Savior do? He didn't say, I will. No, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. And may God get a hold of our hearts and help us to see the importance of raising the white flag in our life and surrendering our life wholly and completely to our master, to our king, our Lord. Then I want you to see secret number two is found in the word submission. This has to do with our actions. What did Jesus do? When he got into the garden, when he got into the garden, and there he is, and Satan unleashes his power against him. Satan unleashes his fury upon him. What does the Son of God do? Does he wilt and concave to Satan? Oh, no. No, not the Son of God. He fights with all of his strength, with all of his power, and he prevails over Satan 
Amen. I'm saying his activity stayed the same. And when you and I as servants are faced with oppression, when we're faced with a persecution, when we're faced with situations and perplexities in our life, may I say it's not time to concave. Oh, no. No, no, no. It's time to stand strong for God. It's time to keep going for God. It's time to plug on for God. Don't quit. No, sir. It's time to go on for the glory of God. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me. Secret number three, it's the word sanctification. This has to do with our address. Our address? Yeah. Not the address that you live at, but what you need to address. See, sanctification has to be with, or has to deal with holiness. And you're reminded in the word of God, it does say, be ye holy as I am holy. Well, how can I do that? I'm a sinner. Yeah, good news. I am too. Good news. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. Hmm. Are you hearing me? I said he's faithful and he's just. How do you know he's faithful? Because I've seen him in the garden. He was faithful there to his master, to his father, to, to the will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, if he'll be faithful to his father, he'll be faithful to his children. Amen. And I'm glad that he is faithful. And the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from, get the word, all unrighteousness. You know what that means? I can be sanctified. I can be holy. I can be set apart for the Lord's glory, for the Lord's honor. I can do a work for him. Amen. Sanctification. Address those things in our life that may be addressed. And lastly, you're probably glad to hear that one. Is we find the secret. Are you listening? Please get a hold of this one. To stay. To stay, yes. But what's that got to do with, preacher? That's got to do with our appetite. Mm. I remember as a young man, well, probably as a kid even, hearing preachers use an illustration of a particular preacher, and I cannot remember the preacher's name. I've heard it so many times, but I can't remember the preacher's name. That he would, he would stay with God and his Bible. And he would pray and read till the pages caused tears in his eyes. You know what that is? That's an appetite for God. Ah, uh, yeah, an appetite for God. Stay with him. You know, the old songwriter said, I'd stay in the garden with him. <laughs> Though the night around me befalls me. But he bids me go. Through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. What are you saying, preacher? Stay, have an appetite that burns so real. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Till finally he says, it's time for you to go. Because when he says it's time to go, you'll go in the power of his might. You'll go with the provision of God upon your life. And you will reach the potential of what God intends you to reach when you go when he bids you to go. The prelude of Calvary, son of God, walks into a garden. And that garden connected to another garden and took care of every th that damage all of the problems of the former garden were taken care of, Brother Gilbert, Pastor, by the garden called Gethsemane. I'm done. I don't know what you want to do. What you, what, what do you want to do, preacher? is this? Friday. And 
we've had how many days of meetings now? You sit just over there. We've had some great, great messages. I'm not in a hurry because I don't think God's going to get in a hurry tonight. We've got another preacher coming. But I want us to take just a couple minutes with him or Brother Fox or up here because we're going to jump over there and let's bow our heads. Let's just have a real quick invitation. Listen, God had to speak to your heart about something in that message.